Are we there? Ada. Yes, no? We should be. Hey, everyone. I'm trying to find us. I... We are not there. No. Um, We're there. There we are. All right, I finally found us. How is everybody doing this evening? Okay. All right. Please let me know you're here. Uh, we've had to make some adjustments for the AV. Going to do a Q&A tonight or ask me anything. I have a few questions that were emailed in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do those first. But be thinking about a question, go ahead and type it in anytime. Okay. Understand that there is a little bit of a delay. Right. So, okay. Uh, I hear you upstairs. All right, so I am trying to, I got to get this so I can see comments. There we are. Uh, hold on just a moment. Had a couple people saying looking for you. All right. Hope everybody's doing well. Enjoyed the vast amount of rain. Okay. Uh, all right. So I'm going to have to look at the phone to uh, watch the questions here. But let's begin with prayer. God, we pause to acknowledge your goodness. We pause to say thank you for your grace and mercy that is just abundant. God, we pause to acknowledge your presence that is with us, that where two or three are gathered, that you are in the midst. And God, even though we're not together in person, you are still in our midst. Thank you and continue to illuminate our hearts and minds through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Uh, it says, I am frozen. Okay, mine, mine is still working. Uh, so, oh, I can see where I just froze up. All right. Okay, well, let's kind of uh, get to it. All right, so there were some, uh, some questions that were emailed. I'm going to deal with those first. If you have other questions, please just... Uh, type them in and, and, and send them. Uh, one was a, a one was an interesting question. I'm going to go back and forth between all the questions. Uh, one had to do with is the United Methodist Church have a stance um, being uh, say pro-Israeli. And uh, a great question. Thank you, Ann, for that. And so I was able to have a few minutes and look up some stuff because I, I understood and it's always been my understanding United Methodist uh, we. We understand that there are Christians in Palestine, that there are Christians in Palestine, and so it's not necessarily pro-Israeli at the exclusion of Palestinians. And we're not just for the Palestinians, even though there's a lot of Christians there, to the exclusion of Israel. So I just wanted to read, we have in the United Methodist Church what is called a Book of Resolutions. Now, they are not binding uh, such as the Book of Discipline with our social principles, uh, but they are resolutions that are passed at General Conference, and, uh, and, and they do have a lot of uh, social principle uh, influence in, in, in our witness around the world. Uh, so we do have a, a resolution about Palestinian Christians and support for their, uh, but, uh, but we also have uh, one of the resolutions is called a Pathway for Peace. 
a pathway for peace in Palestine, Palestine and Israel. And uh, if you want a copy of it, uh, I can give it to you. It's in the Book of Resolutions. I think you can see it online on pages 608 and 609. And there's some other parts uh, of that within that same general area. And this one was adopted. Uh, this resolution was approved at the last general conference in 2016. And I'm going to just read the very last part. Uh, be it further resolved that the general conference encourages our members around the world to develop a balanced understanding of the concerns and perspectives of both Palestinians and Israelis being careful to lift up the voices of those victims of violence and injustice across the region and rejecting oversimplified efforts to simply blame one side or the other, even as we encourage United Methodists to join in prayer for the peace of Jerusalem and all those who call it home. So really, it's to be a balanced understanding of the concerns and the perspectives of both Palestinians and Israelis, not just pro-Israeli to the exclusion of others. And I, I, I would be surprised if United Methodist had a resolution uh, that was such pro one side uh, that excluded others. So uh, that's uh, what I have for that. So good, good evening to everyone. Uh, another question, uh, and it came up after the sermon, on Sunday, it was a sermon on forgiveness, and it was about that unforgiving servant who was forgiven an enormous amount and wouldn't forgive such a small amount, and then the original forgiveness to that servant was revoked. And it really is, because it's a parable about the kingdom of God, uh, God being that king and, and us being that servant and how we forgive. So a follow-up question I got is our salvation also conditional? If salvation seems to be conditional, is our salvation, if forgiveness seems to be conditional, is our salvation conditional? Uh, so I, I want to just spend a moment with that because it seems as if some of the forgiveness does tend to be conditional. In fact, that's what we pray, forgive us as we forgive. But I want us to think about the foundation of that forgiveness and who was forgiven first and the the forgiveness that that happened at first so uh, if you would turn in your bible if you have one or, or some way to look at it to ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 uh, and i'm gonna start at verse uh, four, I think. Yeah, Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace, verse 8, when you believed. And you take, take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. And I love this verse, so I, I need to read it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So salvation is completely by grace. Uh, it is not conditional upon our behavior. So, and forgiveness is completely by grace. Now there is one condition uh, one thing that has to happen for salvation in our life and even for God's forgiveness is we have to accept it we the salvation is not a reward to us it is given to us freely offered to us freely yet we have to accept it uh, and we have free will so we can accept it 
or reject it. And I think it kind of worked the same way with forgiveness in the story. Uh, remember, the, he was forgiven <coughs> uh, such an enormous debt. And I, and I really think that uh, his struggle wasn't just stubbornness. I'm not even sure it was stubbornness or meanness. I, I think in, in the story, and, and of course, it, you know, it is a story, it's, it's a parable, but he really struggled to accept that forgiveness. He goes, there's no way that, that I could be a recipient of such enormous mercy and, and grace and forgiveness, so I'm going to do whatever I can to pay it back to try to earn the forgiveness. So forgiveness, God's forgiving us, is also based on grace. So it's really not conditional. Uh, the story does seem that there are limits, but I think the only real limit is our acceptance. Um, now, we might limit it by the way we behave and our response and our forgiving others as a response to how God forgave us. So I hope that makes sense. So salvation is not conditional, not based on works. It is, it is offered to us as a free gift of God uh, through God's grace. So I'm going to uh, just watch. Uh, so, hey everyone, I, I'm glad uh, for the group that's here watching, we're doing what's called an AMA, Ask Me Anything, or Q&A, Questions and Answers, uh, and I had some emailed to me. If you have a question, please go ahead and type it in. Uh, another question reflected back on uh, baptism. Uh, back on baptism. And I do want to get, sorry, I've got to get uh, a hymnal real quick, so be right there. And, and the question, and I'm not going to, I don't want to really quote it specifically. Uh, if you want to ask it again specifically, go ahead if you don't mind people knowing. Uh, but is is baptism does that initiate or is that salvation for an infant and what would you say you know so what about an infant who isn't baptized and, and dies are, are they condemned to hell or that so first whenever we talk about uh salvation uh, when we talk about forgiveness in the united methodist church i write this write this down in, in the wesleyan tradition in the wesleyan theological tradition i write down these letters g r a c e g r a c e grace let that be the big umbrella or or the foundation you know either way if you want to think of the foundation that everything grows out of or the umbrella that just covers everything else uh, everything ha has to start or go back or be covered by grace in the way we as United Methodist and, and in the Wesleyan tradition look at things. So with baptism of an infant and of children, we're talking about grace. So grace, uh, baptism of the infant, you know, really is that, that symbolism uh, of God's work. And it is our witness that that child has grace. Remember provenient grace? Everybody has provenient grace. Uh, there is no person that is a part that is completely void of grace of God. And we, we call that one provenient grace. Justifying grace is what we're saving. So the infant would still, even before they're baptized, you know, from, from birth until they're baptized, however many weeks, uh, six weeks, two weeks, six days, um, you know, might be a couple of years, uh, still has grace. Uh, still has grace. And uh, and we always say when we start out, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church, incorporated in God's mighty acts of salvation, uh, given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is a gift offered to us without price. So it is grace. And it does say that we are given new birth through water and the spirit uh, and incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. Now the child obviously can't answer for him or herself, so the parents are answering and taking on the responsibility to raise that child in a Christian life. Uh, but what would happen to a child if tragedy, the infant died before baptism? Uh, grace, grace. I, I just cannot believe that 
uh, this innocent infant, uh, innocent infant, uh, would uh, that God would eternally condemn uh, such a beautiful child, uh, innocent, uh, even without the baptism. Uh, now, United Methodists, uh, we admit that we do have some. Uh, there is a little confusion about baptism, and especially about infant baptism, because uh, Wesley was kind of both and. He was evangelical in approach that it is salvation, uh, but also coming out of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, uh, you know, he believed in the infant baptism. Uh, but remember, the baptism is our witness to what God has been doing in that child's life. Um, it is, is a, it is a public profession of what the child, of what God has already been doing in that child's life. And nobody is apart from grace. So I think that's what I would say to a couple that are worried about what might happen to their child before the baptism is there is still grace. There is still grace and God uh, has been at work in the conception of that child and God is still at work in that child. So I, I hope that answered that. If not, let me know. And uh, I'll try to uh, clarify. So if anything uh, is this is, is confusing, uh, please let me know. On that. So. Uh, other questions? I, I still have uh, another question to delve into, but I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, I, I really like the term ask me anything more than question and answer, because as I said on, on Sunday, when it's a Q and A, there's there's got to be an answer. If you ask me anything, I can just say, "Hey, that was that was great. Thanks for asking." Because <laughs> I may not have an answer, I may have to get back with you on that. Uh, oh, uh, another question was the United Methodist uh, stance on hell. Do we believe it is a physical place? Do we believe it's a, it's a physical place? So, uh, in the articles of faith from what we had from the Methodist Church and what we have from the Evangelical United Brethren Church that became United Methodist, and we have both of those articles of religion in our Book of Discipline. Um, so, Wesley, Wesley, of course, being uh, 18th century uh, did his belief was in hell as in a physical place um, hell as in a physical place now our articles religion on the Methodist side don't really specifically address it uh, but in the Evangelical United Brethren it calls hell eternal condemnation eternal condemnation so the images that we might have as far as uh, a lake of fire or eternal darkness, uh, let's remember that's all imagery. Uh, it's, all, it's all imagery. Because uh, if you have a lake of fire, it's probably not going to be eternal darkness. So it's just imagery it, to be taken seriously, but not literally. To be taken seriously, but not literally. And the Hebrew faith had what they called the place of the dead, uh, Sheol, uh, place of the dead. Uh, so, yes, an actual, uh, United Methodist would say it's an actual physical place. Uh, is it a lake of fire? You know, are there little creatures running around with pitchforks and tails? Probably not. Uh, you know, it's kind of that medieval art uh, expression of that. Uh, but it's an internal combination. What it is, is a place that is totally absent from the presence of God. Totally absent from the presence of God. And if you think of all that God is, uh, that God is love, so it would be a place that would be completely absent of, of love. Uh, God is light, so it would be absent of, of light. So it would be darkness, and darkness always symbolized evil, uh, wandering, wilderness, confusion, chaos. Uh, you know, God is love, God is light, God is, God is patient, God is forgiving. 
It is the absence of the presence of God, so it is a, a place that is just absent of everything God is, in, including good. Uh, so it's that kind of, uh, and yes, a place where that happens. So no, hell isn't really for us what we're, uh, I mean, we do have uh, reflections of it here on earth, just as we have reflections of the kingdom of God and heaven here upon earth. Uh, but an actual physical place, just like heaven would be, is what the United Methodist stands. And, and my personal thing it is definitely a place uh, that is absence of the presence of God and all that God is. So I'm going to just see if there's any uh, comments about that. Uh, okay, so we're getting some uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, questions. Okay. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, gonna, gonna deal with some of these. So I, I hope I answered that question about hell. I, I just want to add in a, a couple of things. Uh, if you've ever read the book The Shack or watched the movie The Shack, uh, I think the scene uh, where Mackenzie Phillips has to choose one of his children uh, to go to hell is is pretty powerful because then God, Papa says. You know, you can't choose. How am I supposed to choose a child? And I really like what Max Lucado uh, says about hell. And he says God doesn't send anybody to hell. They volunteer. So I, I do think ultimately that grace and love will win. Uh, but I do think some people really volunteer and work hard to get there. Uh, but I believe God always gives a chance. In fact, in, in Peter... Uh, and I can't remember if it's in 1 Peter or 2 Peter. Uh, biblical scholars help me out. Uh, Peter, in one of his letters, he talks about how Jesus, after he was crucified and put in the tomb, he descended to the dead and preached to those in prison or in hell. So, they were there, and Jesus preached them and gave them a chance. Uh, now that's in uh, First or Second Peter. Sorry, I can't remember the exact reference. Uh, Jeanette, if you know it, uh, I thought it was in Second Peter chapter three, but I might be remembering it wrong. But look it up, where it says Jesus descended to the dead, and that's where that phrase comes into uh, the Apostles' Creed that we usually don't say. Uh, but it's in other versions of the Apostles' Creed used by other expressions of faith that he descended to the dead. Uh, but he was there preaching the good news, preaching grace, and giving those that had been in condemnation uh, an opportunity to... Uh, and don't know if that ever only happened once. Uh, maybe it's something that happened. I don't know. But that that's kind of there. Okay. Uh, so, uh, all right, so I'm going to, uh, all right, why do some churches allow women to be music directors, pastors, deacons, board of directors, and some do not? Uh, great question, Alan, that, uh, great question. Uh, some, uh, and this is going to be my opinion, uh, and my deep conviction, uh, some churches, I believe, misuse, almost abuse, Scripture to exclude women from leadership in the church. Uh, I, I've done enough study on those passages. That is not what they were about. When you look at the early church, when you look at the early church in the book of Acts, women were in leadership. Women were in leadership. All right, let's even go back to the time when Jesus was walking on the earth, uh, he had some very close disciples that were women. Mary, Martha, Mary Magdalene. Uh, there was just uh, Mary, the uh, Joanna, and all, all the all the various Marys uh, were that. And so I think that. Some of those scriptures were, well, women should be quiet, that Paul writes about, Peter writes about. 
uh, what I've come to understand in researching those and studying those scriptures is, uh, especially for Peter when he was doing it, and he does talk about man, you know, the man is the head of the household. He was talking about the Roman culture and acknowledging the Roman culture. But what was happening was women were finding this great independence and leadership in the church and affirmation within the church that wasn't really allowed within the culture. And it was causing conflict at home. And really what's happening is Peter's saying, you know, remember, we're to be good witnesses. Uh, men, husbands are getting turned off from Christianity, and we don't want to do that. So, as I, as I like to say, you know, so after church, the woman gets home, and the guy says, you know, I need a set of uh, new tires for my uh, pickup. And he says, I'm going to go get Goodyear. And the woman knows that the Michelin is better. Just let him buy the Goodyear tires. And then when they're not as good, you can say, I told you so later. Uh, but, you know, remember Lydia. Lydia was starting the church in Philippi. Uh, Uadai and Sintichi in, in Philippi. Uh, they were uh, leaders. Uh, but, uh, so I think they've misused the scripture to keep women and to exclude. The United Methodist Church, uh, we had that for we did that for years. But in the United Methodist Church, uh, women can be ordained, serve as pastor. Um, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean every church, even in the United Methodist Church, is accepting of a woman pastor. And that is unfortunate. And it doesn't mean that there aren't some people sitting in the pews that don't accept a woman pastor, even in the United Methodist Church. And my wife could probably tell you a couple of stories about that. So, uh, not at this church. Uh, so, uh, all right. I hope that uh, answered it. I remember one time, Alan, I remember uh, I was in a, a different city and we were doing uh, I was going to preach the baccalaureate service for the high school and the ministerial fellowship, the pastors in the town that got together for the ministerial fellowship uh, really organized it. It was going to be at a church that didn't allow women to speak uh, as, you know, teach scripture, be a pastor. And the student that was going to be speaking to their class, the valedictorian, was, was a female. Uh, and she wasn't going to be allowed to speak from the stage of the church. She could speak, but she had to be on the main floor. So what we did was every other student that was gonna speak, if they were a male student, they could be up on stage. Everybody spoke from the main floor. I did my sermon from the main floor and just none of us got on stage. That way it wouldn't cause trouble for that pastor or difficulty in the church. We, we tried to honor that, uh, but we wanted to show unity uh, and, and support for the females in that class. And I, I thought it was a pretty good witness. Um, right, so here's a good one. If you take a little break, can we have Pastor Jeanette to give us a message some Sunday morning? Yes. So here you go. Are you ready? Mark down September 20th. Mark down on your calendar September 20th. Come to the 830 outdoor service. Jeanette will be speaking, preaching, or 1045 Facebook Live, Jeanette will be speaking. Uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I will be here. I get to listen to her. So thank you for the suggestion. We already got that lined up. So you will get to hear Pastor Jeanette give a message on September 20th. All right. Uh, oh, thank you, Ann. 1 Peter 4.6. Um, all right, so other questions. Oh, let me go back to, uh, let me just mention this. Uh, if you have a United Methodist hymnal, if you have a United Methodist hymnal, uh, I invite you to uh, sometime look at number 276. It's called The First One Ever. Uh, the First One Ever, beautiful hymn. You know, the first one ever or ever to know of the birth of Jesus was the maid Mary. Uh, the first one ever or ever to know of Messiah, Jesus, when he said, I am he, 
was the Samaritan woman. The first one ever, oh, ever to know of the rising of Jesus, his glory be, were Mary, Joanna, and Magdalene. And the song, the refrain is, and blessed is she uh, who believes. Blessed are she who perceives, blessed is, are they who see. A uh, beautiful hymn, a uh, beautiful hymn. Uh, it's called The First One Ever, number 276 in the hymnal. Uh, Timothy, you asked what Bible is this? Uh, this is what's called uh, the NLT Study Bible. It's a New Living Translation. It's called the New Living Translation. Uh, it's a Study Bible, New Living Translation. Um, I, I know they're on Amazon. I usually order them from a place called uh, CBD. Not the cannabis oil. <laughs> uh, it used to be called Christian Book Distributors. I think they're just called Christian Book now. It used to be CD, CBD for short, but Christian Book, uh, ChristianBooks.com. Uh, they usually have the best price on these. If you can't find one, Timothy, uh, come on up. I'll give you this one, and, and I'll get another one, okay? Uh, so uh, just let me know if you need this one. Uh, if you can't get one, and if you need this one, uh, we'll make sure we get it to you, okay? Uh, but it is, it is. Uh, I like the New Living Translation. That I, that's my favorite study Bible uh, out of all of them. Okay. Oh, thank you, Jeanette. Yes, Christian book. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I can, uh, Timothy. I can accept you into the United Methodist Church. Uh, you don't necessarily have to change from being Episcopalian. Uh, you can stay, we can, because uh, we have what's called associate or affiliate membership, so you can be part of this church and part of the Episcopal Church. My wife, Jeanette, who is on with us, uh, she joined the Methodist Church from the Episcopalian Church. So, uh, uh, if you need transportation to the church, or if you want to let me know where you are, I, I can bring the Bible out to you if you're relatively uh, in close proximity. Uh, all right, I missed a question. I'm trying to get back to it. Something just happened with my phone. Thank you. What question did I miss? Ann Carpenter. In the Bible, we read, I have plans for you. If we have plans for you, we have plans for you. If we have plans for you, we have plans for you. If we have free will, how does God know all our plans? If so, how is it free will? Okay, where is that? I don't see that. That's why I missed it. Uh, two below where asked if the pastor's been at the okay, so I'm, I'm looking uh, for that question. Uh, I have Anne going 1 Peter 4 6. Okay, Anne, I'm sorry. I'm, your question isn't coming through on mine. So, ask the, let's, let me hear the question again. In the Bible, we read. Okay, so Anne, I think you're referring to the passage out of Jeremiah. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to give you a future, uh, a future filled with hope. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, I think. So let, let's look at it. Yeah, Jeremiah 29, 11. Okay. So first off, first off, and I know this is a little technical, uh, first off, that verse that we personalized so much and individualized was really a corporate verse to the people of Israel in exile. Uh, that I have plans for your restoration. Uh, I have plans... Uh, to restore you as a nation. So, uh, when we think of it broadly, we know that God has planned uh, for salvation in us. That is God's desire. So that's that's the first thing. 
Uh, but so I know the plans I have for you, says Lord. So with that, uh, maybe just think about plans. Uh, maybe not so much as a daily agenda that God has for us. Uh, and really, I'm hearing the question as a, a question about God's will and God's plans for our life. And yes, we do have free will. So uh, let me try this. Let me try this. Uh, I view God's will as a very broad path, not just a very narrow thing. Um, I, I think that God, God's will, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, people you want to know what, what career, uh, you know, probably several career careers God would be okay with as long as you're trying to glorify God in all of those. Um, and, I, and I think what happens with our, our decisions is there's this broad spectrum of God's will and this decision we make is still within God's will. If we make a little different decision, it's still within God's will. It's when we rebel, uh, we get outside of God's will and we would be outside, say, of God's plans for our life. God doesn't force those plans on us. God doesn't force God's plans on us. So we're not puppets. We do have the free will, but it still can be God's plans because they're not forced on us. God has this desire for us to live our life for God. Uh, so I hope, is that making sense? But God doesn't force that on us. So we still have the free will and we still can be outside of God's plans because uh, God doesn't force us there. And it's not just a one lane highway. It might be an eight lane highway, uh, could, be, could be broader. So uh, Okay. All right, Timothy, um, handbell choir, great. Uh, I got your address. We'll try to get this uh, Bible to you. All right. Uh, uh, is the scripture the one that is often used to support Israel to restore you as a nation? Uh, most likely. And in, in, in the Psalms, we, uh, we pray. Uh, you know, it says to pray for, for Israel. Uh, in Jeremiah, it also says to pray that in the city in which you, you find yourself. Uh, so yes, and let's remember that we come out of uh, the Hebrew faith. Uh, we as Christians have a very close affinity uh, with uh, people of Israel. Uh, that's where Jesus lived, uh, was you know, born and raised. So uh, yes, uh, you know, there is uh, that idea of restoring the nation of of Israel, uh, and yet um, I, I love the resolution that didn't want to blame. So now let me know if the thing about God's plans made sense. Uh, if anybody wants to type in uh, another thought about that or how you look at it, just but God doesn't force God's plans on us. I, I think you know come down to that. So and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop just for a minute to get caught up to y'all. So Kelly, are you seeing some questions? Maybe I'm not. Because I didn't, on my phone, I do not have that one from Ann. Um. Okay, so I'm getting some comments on my phone. Uh, some of them, I don't know why I'm not getting them. Uh, Kelly is seeing them all, so we're trying to compare, uh, make sure we're getting everything. Uh, so Jeanette, I, your comment about, uh, oh, 
okay. Uh, like we have plans for our children to be happy, loved, etc. Uh, sometimes they choose a different path, but I, I didn't get the thing about intentions. So, yeah. So there we go. All right, other questions? I, I had four that were emailed to me. I think I got all four of those. So, while you're thinking of a question for me, I have a question for you. Yes, go ahead. Do you think we will attend services in person inside this year? Not what you know, just what you think. Okay, so what do I think? Do we have, will we have services inside this year? Uh, yes, I, I do think that. Uh, there's nothing definite set. Uh, the advisory group, uh, we got to get together again. Uh, not this month. Not this month. We have our outdoor worship. Now, if the weather isn't permitting on Sunday for outdoor worship, uh, the group is small enough we can easily come into the sanctuary bright and early on Sunday morning. Uh, but yes, I, I do. Uh, my hope is that um, maybe we can try in October. Uh, we will have uh, two or three people here for UMW Sunday on September 20th, two or three people that want to come. Because uh, they'll be doing stuff in the service and that, and that's that's fine. Uh, but we need to see what happens after Labor Day. Give it a couple weeks after Labor Day, and with school starting, uh, watch that you know Bell County dashboard, which is hard to interpret sometimes. I watch Worldometer. I look at the Bell County Health page. Uh, I get information from the uh, Temple Telegram, and. Uh, it, it did look like active cases were going down. I don't know if that's still the case in the last 24 or 48 hours. Uh, hospitalizations have not been as bad as uh, in some other areas. Uh, so I do think we'll be back in. Uh, it will still be very limited. Uh, we still will have to mark off pews. So I don't think we're uh, going to have a time where we have 150 in the sanctuary this year. Uh, and we're already making some plans on Christmas Eve for uh, you know more than two services so we could accommodate uh, anybody that would want to come in person on Christmas Eve uh, we're trying to figure all that out so I know brunch church uh, they're looking at the possibility of September 20th and, and just know that all these dates of course are written in very light pencil <laughs> so they can easily be erased and adjusted uh, nothing's in pen, but brunch church, possibly September 20th. Uh, they're working hard to be able to do that. Hopefully, hopefully limited sanctuary on uh, sometime in October. But we got to watch. Uh, I would, I would love to to be able to try it October 4th, and, and I know it'll be a, a, a small group, uh, but it might have to be even later than that. Uh, we're still planning our anniversary celebration in November. Uh, I hope we can have uh, some people in the sanctuary for that. Uh, Mark Winter will be doing God's Calvary Man, the circuit rider presentation. And Mark will be doing it at both services, the 830 and the 1045. Even if the 830 is still outside, uh, he's going to do it. So thank you for that. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, I'm hoping I'm getting a lot. So here's my question for, for all of you. And uh, if you're not United Methodist, uh, I, I apologize, because uh, this is really, uh, or you can answer it for your own church. You can answer it for your own church. Uh, but like the one or, or two things that you appreciate most about the United Methodist Church if you're not United Methodist, just say, well, this is what I really appreciate about my church, um, and say what church that is, because it's always good to be affirming and positive. Uh, we're not trying to be exclusive here. As United Methodists, we realize that we're not really, uh, we're not better than anybody else. We don't have a, a corner on truth. Uh, we're just, you know, we're, we're learning as we go as well. We're imperfect people, as all people are. But what do you, one or two things, that, that you really appreciate the most about the United Methodist Church.
And you can uh, maybe reply to each other there on that. So uh, Ann Carpenter, open hearts, open minds, open doors. Jeanette Miller, the first thing is grace. The second thing is grace. <laughs> that's great. Uh, uh, well, that's wonderful, Sherry. Uh, uh, appreciating your pastor there in, in uh, Killeen, uh, St. Andrews in Killeen. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, taking the Bible seriously, but not literally. That's great. Uh, open to anyone and the music. Uh, and the ability to uh, disagree about non-essentials. Yes. Yes. Um, we, we hope that that continues in the United Methodist Church. We, we agree that we will disagree on some non-essential stuff. Uh, some of that is uh, some of us some people in the United Methodist Church disagree on uh, the style of music, contemporary verse, traditional hymns, or how the flow of worship will go. Uh, some people in the United Methodist Church, uh, the essential thing is that we have worship. Uh, the essential thing is that we have worship on that. So uh, others, I, I think I got it. Well, I appreciate all that. That's, that's great. Um, and, and I appreciate the grace and the acceptance in the United Methodist Church. Um, I, I really do. I mean, there are some expressions of the Christian faith that would not allow me to be a pastor because I'm divorced. Uh, they certainly wouldn't allow my wife to be a pastor. Uh, she can be a pastor's wife, but not a pastor. Uh, but I don't even know if they would like that because uh, she doesn't even know how to play piano. So, you know, the stereotypical pastor's wife. Uh, and God bless all those uh, people that do know how to play piano. I admire them. I've tried it twice. Never was able to get the uh, hang of it. Uh, social justice emphasis. And yes, taking the Bible seriously, but not literally. Um, and, and if that was uh, your best takeaway, and biggest takeaway from uh, being United Methodist in the Bible Belt, I, I think that's great. That's a good takeaway. And I hope that helps you in your own reading of, of the Bible and your own discovery of, of the truth in Scripture. Other questions? Any other questions? Oh, Sherry, you know, join anytime. I'd love to have you and glad you have a, a powerful uh, church home. Uh, you've got a great home church. And uh, David is, is a great pastor, so uh, it's wonderful, but you just join us anytime. Uh, lo love to have you and, and glad that you have a church that you are part of. Uh, happy for you on that. Uh, uh, Belt and UMC has such a love for one another. Well, a absolutely on that. And uh, yeah, Sherry, we're just really excited. Uh, thank you. You can be part of this anytime. So just uh, in case you have another question, please. The next two weeks, we're going to take a break. But don't get too used to not being here. Because on the, uh, so September 9th and September 16th, and I cannot believe I'm saying that already. September. Wow. Uh, can't believe it's already September 2nd. September 9th and September 16th, uh, we'll be taking uh, a break, a sabbatical from our Wednesday night Bible study. The 23rd, we will come back and we will start a series on the covenants in the Bible. You know, God's promises that are not to be broken. Uh, the covenants that God has made uh, with humanity, with us. Uh, working on putting together a little study guide, a little study guide that we can send out if you, if you need us to print it and mail you one like that. It's one I'm developing. Uh, so kind of still working on it. Uh, to give us a guide and give you an opportunity to write down some notes. So uh, I hope that you uh, won't get too used to not being here on Wednesday nights. And we'll join back on the 23rd. So uh, uh, well, I, uh, if time allows, well, it looks like time is allowing. Oh, no, I'm out of time, Jeanette. I can't answer that. 
And if time allows, can you please respond to people who think COVID is God's punishment and or proof of the last days? Well, I will reply. Jeanette, if you want to uh, chime in with your own expression of that, uh, obviously I don't think that. I do not think COVID is God's punishment uh, in any way on us. Uh, do I think uh, God caused it? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. Uh, I, so let me say this, because this is probably the most important part, then I'll add some fluff. I do believe that God is at work in it and through it, and will be at work beyond it. This is what we read in Romans chapter 8. Uh, God works everything for good. Uh, Romans chapter 8, and the, the NLT is a good translation for this one because uh, you can it, it helps make the point. So I'm going to get to Romans chapter 8. Because I think this is another verse that sometimes gets uh, a little misunderstood. Uh, so Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to God's purpose for them. So I just want to say, a lot of times people cut that verse short and they just say, and we know that God causes everything they stop there, they don't read the rest of it, and oh, well, God must be causing COVID. That is not what this scripture verse says. It said God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to God's uh, purpose for them. Uh, it tells me that God is causing things, causing, trying to cause some good, just as in when God created and looked upon everything, each day God said, and it is good. And God said, and it is good. And when God looked upon everything, he said, very good. And that creative power, that power of goodness in God, ha has been at work ever since. Uh, God wants to cause good. So if there's some good that comes of this, uh, you know, maybe it helped reset people's thinking on a more simplified life. Uh, maybe it helped reset... Uh, creation, you know, and uh, uh, ecology, and, 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 and the earth got a little breather for a moment, uh, that could be good. If it, uh, it has caused us in the church uh, to have to look at ministry in a different way, and probably for uh, this century, uh, and I think that can be a good thing. The other thing that it did was, you know, churches really came together at first, and you know, church of uh, different denominations saying, hey, you need to tape a sermon. Come on. You can use our team, use our technology. We'll help you get that done. Uh, and, and there was some of that. Uh, I, I think it gave a lot of family time, which uh, for a lot of people was good. And some people, because of the family situations, well, that wasn't that good. Uh, so it's just, uh, but if there's some good that can come of this, God is at work to do that. So no, God... Did not call the COVID. It's not God's punishment. And uh, let me just get the other part of that question there. Uh, oh, and our proof of the last days. You know, I'm going to say no. So a couple of things. Here's a couple of little fluff about it. Uh, I remember uh, just a, picking up a pamphlet off of my porch that had fallen off the door uh, back in the 90s. A very disgusting a uh, little flyer that said AIDS is God's punishment upon gays. I, how awful that Christians would put that out there. Uh, I didn't like it then. I don't like it now. Uh, so I don't think that was God's punishment. Uh, proof of the last days. Uh, true story. I was in college at the time. Do you remember the Tylenol scare? Is anybody old enough to remember uh, the Tylenol scare, you know, somebody had put something in 
bottles of Tylenol and because of this, this is why you can't open a bottle of Tylenol anymore and we have all the safety wrappings on everything. Uh, I remember being at the cafeteria Sunday afternoon uh, sitting with some friends and they had gone to a church where the pastor's sermon was that was proof of the last days that, and I don't remember if it was Zechariah or Zephaniah, had prophesied about the Tylenol thing. Uh, that was a bit of a stretch to me. So no, I don't think this is proof of the last days. Uh, I, I just do know that the return of Christ gets closer every day. So let me try to catch up on some of the comments here. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's that's my thing as, as I say no uh, on that. I understand some of you are hearing that. Uh, God does not cause bad things to happen, but he will use bad things to cause, yeah, Kelly. Uh, God is at work in the midst. Uh, God is with us, and that's good, yeah. So, uh, thank you for that. All right, yeah, anything else? Have a couple minutes left. Have, have just a couple minutes left. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the Bible studies that we've done. Uh, Uh, especially the being United Methodist in the Bible Belt. Again, it wasn't about how United Methodists are better. We were trying to do the distinctives, but I hope that you also saw how much we have in common with our fellow Christians as we went along that study uh, and the studies that we did uh, before that. Again, we're getting ready to do a study in the covenant uh, on that. So, uh, this coming Sunday... This coming Sunday, September 6th, uh, outdoor worship. If it's not too muddy and it's not raining, if it is, we'll come inside the sanctuary. It's roped off. The elevator is usable, but if you come in the elevator, you have to sit on that side of the sanctuary. You come in the door from the sanctuary, you have to sit on that side of the sanctuary so we don't have a uh, crisscrossing of, of folk. Okay, 1045, live, Facebook live, crossing our fingers, uh, with communion. Uh, and we're continuing our study in instructions not included on the parables. The parable for this coming Sunday, September 6th, is, uh, well, no, the, uh, the unforgiving servant was last week. Oh, a parable about the laborers in the vineyard uh, in Matthew 20. And then for the 13th, we're going to jump to Matthew 25, and we're going to get the story of 10 young bridesmaids uh, and the significance of five of them uh, and what that says for our own Christian life. But remember the hand. We're going to use the hand on that Sunday. And then on the 20th, so excited, uh, 1045 service, United Methodist Women's Sunday. Very excited about that at both worship services that day. Well, uh, at two of the three worship services that day. So at 8.30, lawn service, Jeanette will be bringing the message and for United Methodist Women's Sunday here in the sanctuary. Facebook Live, YouTube, Jeanette will be bringing the message. Hopefully brunch church will have their start that day and John will be bringing the message that day. On the 13th of September for lawn chair church, uh, John Carmen will be bringing the message. A lot of you haven't been able to hear him for a long time. Uh, so we're trying to get back to that kind of schedule. And we look back to being together in person. Uh, my prayers remain with you. Uh, stay safe. Stay safe out there. I'm not so much worried about you, but there's some other people out there that they just don't want to be safe. Uh, stay away from them. Stay away from them. Uh, let's continue to pray for UMHB here that things continue to go well. Let's be in prayer. Tuesday, school starts uh, in Belton, and I believe Temple as well. Uh, school started in Colleen this past week. Let's keep all the schools, all the teachers, all the staff, students and families, and especially those that have had to make that difficult decision of saying, I'm going to homeschool again. That's what I want to do, because that is hard on the parents, hard on the children. We know that. And for those that that's not an option because of the uh, economic reality, uh, that they have to work. They don't have that option. Uh, let's keep all of them in our prayers as well. So may 
God bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. Hold on just a second. Let me make sure I got everything. Oh, yes. Jeanette says the prodigal son on 920. Uh, talking about the prodigal son. And knowing what Jeanette is doing, it's going to be from a little different angle. Very excited about it. Uh, thank you all. God bless.